Well, grace and peace, beloved, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, the kingdom of God is like... Well, it's a good question. Uh, because matters of faith are often difficult to understand, Jesus uses parables to offer insight into the meaning of these often indescribable concepts. Well, Matt Skinner describes parables as comparisons that are meant to cast two things alongside one another to cause uh, contrast and reflection. In Jesus' use of parables to describe the kingdom of God, he doesn't explain how one is supposed to recognize God's kingdom, but makes it clear that we will need to adapt, adopt, or receive new ways of perceiving God's reign. Well, Caroline Lewis comments on Jesus' penchant for parables as a mean to make sense of things and a way to be in the world. Parables are often the only way to make sense of the world and our lives. So by the use of parables, sometimes we're able to catch glimpses of its meaning and then there's other times that we don't. Parables are for exploration, for engaging the imagination, and for discovery on how faith works. Well, on my continuing education journey to Greece and Turkey this spring, one day as we were traveling by bus, we saw fields and fields of the bright yellow mustard plants, like what you see in the pictures. It was so vibrant and such contrast, you couldn't help but see it. Well, these plants were purposely planted to harvest for use as an aromatic and flavorful food seasoning, and they were also used medicinally in dressings. Well, ground mustard was one of the many spices that were offered for sale in the, in the spice market in Istanbul. While mustard plants would not be chosen for growing in an ornamental garden, they're not a stately tree or a well-maintained shrub. They are ill-mannered, they're bushy, and they're an invasive plant. No one would purposely plant mustard to use in their uh, landscape, in their yard. Well, to understand Jesus' humor in this parable, Jesus, uh, imagine Jesus saying, the kingdom of God is like a lovely dandelion the prettiest of all flowers. She spreads her seeds not knowing where they land. They grow without fertilizer and care. And one morning you wake up and your yard is filled with these beautiful flowers. You don't know how they got there, yet they're in, an enduring feature in your landscape. Well, with these two parables side by side in our reading, Jesus uses this agricultural language to give insight into the mystery of God's reign on earth. The mustard seed plant, or the mustard plant, doesn't grow into a stately tree or bush, yet it grows. And the seeds, um, like the seeds freely sowed, we don't know how, but it does. Well, God is at work growing God's kingdom even when we do not see immediate results. Well, the amazing and mysterious thing is that God's reign emerges from the ordinary and the unexpected. It's growing now, even if we can't perceive it, and it is among us already. God's kingdom is not about a place where you'll go when you die. It's about living in and with God's reign right now. In other words, God's kingdom's reign is not about geography. It's about the dynamic reality of God's presence and power within creation and within the lives of God's people. Well, just as seeds are not alien to the earth but part of it, so God's reign becomes a part of the earth. Like that seed that's uh, sowed hither and yon, that grows while you are asleep. The process of God's reign is inevitable growth. Fruit develops and matures. The harvest is assured. 
Well, Jesus assures us that the coming reign is certain, whether we work towards that reality or not. Well, God doesn't depend on us for the spiritual or the numerical growth, like the sower who randomly scatters those seeds. We are to scatter God's good words and deeds and leave the growth to the Holy Spirit. The sower was ignorant of how the seed steadily grew, yet the sower did his part. He spread the seeds, not keeping, him, keeping them to himself. Well, think of all the things that happen when you are asleep. Things that are way beyond your ability to either control or produce. Frank Honeycutt ventures that the planets and the stars move across the sky. Schools of fish swim together looking for a midnight snack. The sun sets and rises. People and other creatures are conceived in a mysterious union. The Holy Spirit continually searches the hearts of guilty sinners, always more ready to, uh, more than ready to offer unlimited and readily available grace. God is calling us to pay attention to these, the, all these mysteries that are in plain view in God's reign. God is calling us to notice and enjoy these life-giving and sustaining gifts. Well, when we spread the seeds of God's reign, nourish them with the deeds of love and justice, watered by the spirit of life, these seeds will gradually take root and grow. The deeper the roots, the stronger the plant stem, the higher their growth. The higher the growth, the wider the reach and spread, and the greater and larger fruits will be harvested. While these nurtured seedlings will pervade the fields in which they are planted and beyond. And in their growth, they offer peace and shelter to all who need it. Jesus doesn't specify where God's reign will take root and grow, whether in the world or in someone's heart, only that it will grow gradually and automatically, whether people desire it or not. Like any fast replicating plants, and I think of Creeping Charlie, because I have plenty in my yard, uh, God's rain will get into everything. It brings vibrant life and color to desolate places. It will crowd out other concerns. God's mercy and love will grow unfettered, and its aroma will fill the air. Well, God's reign will not remain a secret forever, but will emerge with willful persistence. God's reign doesn't depend on our ingenuity, our social engineering, our moral value, piety, or spiritual cleverness. Yet Jesus is not endorsing a passivity or complacency on our part either. In other verses in Mark, Jesus calls all would-be disciples to be co-partners with Christ in his activity. Well, when we freely sow God's seeds, we can't control how a particular person will be changed or affected. That is the mystery and the power of faith. Yet we're not to be stingy in sowing God's good news of Jesus. We're to sow liberally. And with such good news, we can scatter seeds joyfully knowing that the Spirit is at work nurturing that growth. Well, Martin Luther wasn't concerned about his preaching. Luther knew that the power of his sermon wasn't based on the power of his theological insight. He knew that the power of his sermon wasn't based on his elegance or his abilities. He knew that the power of the sermon would have no effect whatsoever unless the very word of God got into a person's heart. So Luther knew that it wasn't him who could do that. It was the Holy Spirit who did that. So he said, after I preach my sermon on Sunday, 
when I return home, I drink my little glass of Wittenberg beer, and I just let the gospel run its course. Well, when God plants seeds, they are seeds of resurrection hope. The tree of life, that cross that we gather around, may not appear to be that impressive, but it grew into a power far beyond our understanding. The Christian movement began with a small, as a small insignificant movement led by an unimposing leader who gets crucified and his 12 fickle followers. But look at it now. There's 2.4 billion Christians worldwide. And the fruit that they have borne is unbelievably rich and full and good. So when you pray, thy kingdom come, expect great things to happen. God's kingdom is already here without our prayer. But when we pray this, as Martin Luther said, we pray that it may come also to us. And when God's kingdom reigns in your lives, you will see that God is doing something new. No one is beyond God's reach, for, it can take, for God can take a new shoot and plant it on a mountain. God can replant you, creating a new creation so that your faith grows again. Because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, your abiding with God produces deep roots of faith. Your fruit will be plentiful and you will be filled with the life and breath of the Holy Spirit. Well, God's kingdom reign, as the Apostle Paul writes, is when we are no longer compelled to live for ourselves, but compelled to live for Jesus Christ and one another. As Bob Eldon professes, living in the kingdom of God requires us to accept ambiguity, accept that we are not always in control, and then step off the ledge of mystery. So look, we may see a crop that we couldn't imagine emerge out of some fertile soil. Growth happens without our understanding. It may look weak, but someday it will fill the world with the love and peace that God had intended all along. So watch and be amazed. Amen.